All right, guys, we're going to get started. We're doing chapter 22, and this will talk about visual and hearing issues that your patient might have. And so we are actually starting on page 388, 388 under uncorrectable visual impairment. Okay, visual impairment. There are millions of people in the United States, for instance, that can't even read like a newspaper, uh, even with glasses. And so there are different uh, levels. We categorize the le level of visual loss, such as total blindness, where there's no light perception at all, no usable vision, versus functional blindness, when there is some light perception, but still no usable vision. Uh, legal blindness in the, in the United States actually means that you have a visual acuity of uh, 20 over 200 or less in the better eye with correction. So that's 20 over 200 in the better eye, but with correction. Uh, a lot of reasons for blindness in the United States, but many of them are preventable causes, such as cataracts and glaucoma, macular de degeneration, diabetic retinopathy. Um, only 4% of blindness in the United States is an actual result of injury. When you're assessing someone for visual impairment, um, just realize, as I just said, there are different levels of visual impairment. You want to know the duration. How long has this been going on? How has it impacted their functional abilities? What can they can't do? Has it affected their job, their activities, their daily um, ADLs, um, their self-esteem, their feelings of usefulness are all things that you want to make sure that you assess. Okay, as far as nursing care continued, health promotion is huge. We said that there are different levels of visual disturbances and many of them could be prevented from um, getting worse, such as cataracts, macular degeneration, um, glaucoma. So we want to make sure that people understand and seek uh, visual care. We also need to make sure that we see, um, check into the families, uh, include the families when possible, and what is their um, involvement in the patient's care in supporting the patient. We want to maintain um, emotional support, so a lot of times this can be done with the family, provide effective communication with the patient. Just to make sure that you understand, if you do have someone who has a visual impairment, you want to actually stand slightly in front of them to one side, offer them an elbow to hold on to, and just walk slightly ahead of them and you should actually describe the environment to help keep them oriented. Okay, so <clears throat> remember there are um, different variations of how much someone who is classified as being legally blind has as far as vision. They can still have some useful vision, so you need to assess this. If this is an acute situation, injury, rehab, um, is probably going to be needed during this time. There'll be a focus on their independence, their productivity, um, teaching them how to use optical devices if that's uh, necessary, and non-optical methods for vision enhancement. Making appropriate referrals, you know, state agencies for rehab for the blind. Often people who are legally blind are eligible for federal and state assistance income tax benefits. There's the American Foundation for the Blind. Um, you know, vision substitute techniques have to be learned when there's no functional vision, such as Braille or audiobooks for reading, um, cane, guide dog therapy for ambulation. Um, for low vision situations, there's um, desktop video magnification systems and there's handheld magnification uh, systems, uh, text-to-speech um, scanning, so it can actually read material to you out loud. Um, there are a lot of computerized programs now 
that actually can re read um, material aloud. Um, Non-optical vision enhancements include, you know, possibly sitting closer. Uh, black and white TV actually is easier to uh, notice um, outlines and increasing lighting and large type. All right, if you're following along in the book, we are on page 302. I'm going to talk about cataracts. Cataracts is just an opacity over the lens. Um, it actually leads, though, to a decrease in vision, abnormal color perception, and a glaring vision. In the United States, it's a huge issue. Um, a lot of Americans have it by the time they're 40, but by the time we're 80, more than 50% have cataracts. So it's the leading cause of blindness worldwide and a major loss of vision in the United States. It actually, in the United States, costs like $6.8 billion a year to take care of cataracts, and it is the most common surgical procedure in the United States at this time. Um, most cataracts are what we call senile-related. And senile related just means it's associated with the fact that you're old. Um, other things that lead to um, cataracts is uh, UV light exposure. So down here, guys, wear your sunglasses. Uh, maternal rub rubella has been linked. Um, certain drugs, especially steroids, corticosteroids have been leaked. Um, anything that causes ocular inflammation. Um, and also people with diabetes. Um, tend to develop cataracts at a younger age too. So what I want to remind you guys, wear your sunglasses. And if you have children, teach them to wear their sunglasses. Okay, uh, diagnostics, uh, history and physical. These people typically complain of decreased visual acuity. Uh, a lot of times they complain that they don't see the colors clearly, that there's a glare, especially at night. Um, uh, the ophthalmoscope or slit lamp microscope will reveal uh, the opaque lens and you can actually see the opaque lens for one that's advanced. Um, if you see table 22.2 in your book and this is on page 393, page 393, you'll see other diagnostic studies that are useful in diagnosing cataracts. So when we look at the treatment for cataracts, there's non-surgical versus surgical care. Certainly non-surgical therapy is usually what we begin with. You can have cataracts in one or both eyes. One can be worse than the other, but it doesn't mean that you necessarily need surgery at this point. You just need to have your eyeglasses changed, maybe start to wear reading glasses, use a magnifier, and have increased lighting. Um, another thing is, is Often at night, if the glare makes it difficult to drive, they just may, patients might need to elect to not drive at night, only um, drive during the daytime hours. Eventually, if the cataract progresses, the lens becomes opaque enough, then surgery is necessary. So it's just a matter of having a little bit of sedation, a local anesthesia into the eye. They actually make a slit, remove the opaque lens and put in a new what we call intraocular lens implant, an intraocular lens implant. This is a relatively very simple procedure now that is done on an outpatient, outpatient basis. Post up, this is an outpatient surgery procedure, so when the sedation's worn off, the patient's ready to go home, someone's going to have to drive them, they're going to have decreased visual acuity in the eye that they've had surgery. There are going to be some post-op meds involved. These meds are aimed at preventing infection and decreasing inflammation, so there'll be a regimen of eye drops that the patient's either going to have to instill or have someone instill. Limited activities, obviously they can't drive for the day. Uh, one eye, if covered, does alter your depth perception. It's becoming increasingly popular to not cover that eye because of this. Uh, but the patient is also advised to avoid such activities that increase intraocular pressure. So any activities that increase intraocular pressure, we want to avoid. Those would be like bending, stooping, coughing, lifting, sleeping on the affected side. Those need to be um, avoided until the physician tells you otherwise. There'll be uh, post-up follow-up visits. 
These post-op follow-up visits will check intraocular pressure to make sure it's okay. The uh, new implant is healing where it's been sutured in. Um, and at some point when the healing is done, there'll need to be a final prescription for glasses for both near and far vision.